excited today because I have my wonderful, amazing, inspiring daughter here with me. She is the reason I'm doing what I'm doing today. And her beautiful calligraphy is actually my name and my logo on everything I do because Jordan is, you're my reason. So welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> And so the first thing I'm going to ask you is how has knowing your temperament, because you grew up with me, but you were the reason I started doing temperament because I was doing it with business teams. And I thought, I can't understand my own daughter. And I'm yelling at her all the time <laughs> for things like not cleaning your room. And, and I was just, I thought I was going to break you. I thought you, I was going to mess you up for life because I was such a bad mom. And so I thought, you know, what I'm doing Myers-Briggs and, and Enneagram with business teams, I can learn my own daughter's personality because I know she's different from me. So I taught you at an early age. Um, I think it has, it's definitely been extremely impactful to me for the past few years. I would say that I am not naturally very self-aware. Um, I don't think I ever have been naturally self-aware. And I think because of all of these temperament, um, all these helpful things with temperament, I have been able to see my weaknesses and see my strengths and try and grow in those, which has been extremely helpful. Um, so I am an ISTP and I am an eight on the Enneagram. And so um, I'm a little bit different than most girls, I would say. And so the way that I handle emotions and the way that I handle situations logically is gonna look a little bit different. And the way that I communicate with others has not always been the best and empathy has always been a huge struggle for me. But I think through the Myers-Briggs and the Enneagram, as well as just life experiences, I've been able to learn how to have empathy how to relate to other women um, since I'm not, I don't fit the, the, um, the poster child of a woman, I guess. So yeah, I would say it's been extremely helpful to me in a lot of ways, uh, in a lot of ways. And I'm sort of the poster child of a woman because <laughs> I <laughs> am a number one feeler. I'm an extroverted feeler. So I show my feelings. I can relate to others really easily and Jordan is my opposite. So extroverted feeling is her baby function. And Jordan's number one function is logic. It's this out of the box, strategic thinking, logical, calm brain. And that's my baby. And so when I was like reacting out of emotion with Jordan, she's probably thinking my mom's an alien. I have no idea why she's getting so emotional. That's really strange. And so I had to differentiate Jordan and me. I had to tell you from early on, Jordan, we're so different. Oh my gosh. I admire the way you're calm and you're rational because I just lost it. So I've been kind of talking to you like that your whole life and appreciating your strengths, but it wasn't always like that. I didn't always appreciate your strengths. So Jordan, tell everyone how your amazing introverted thinking brain works because it's a very unusual type of brain for a girl because most women, 75% of women are feelers. They have a feeling brain function as either their number one or their number two function. And you have feeling as your baby function mm -hmm. and you have thinking as your number one function. So talk about how your brain works differently. Yeah, so um, I am an engineer, engineering major, I'm going to be an engineer, hopefully, Lord willing. And I love physics. I love math. I love chemistry. Um, I know that's all most people um, will ask me, Jordan, what major? You? And I go to Biola University, so it's like a Christian university. It's like 60% women, 40% men. So most of the people there are not majoring in engineering. <laughs> um, okay, so when I tell people, oh, I'm an engineer major, they're like, what What are you doing? Why? Why would you do that? That sounds awful. And to me, I'm like, it's actually 
fun. It's really challenging. And um, I like using that side of my brain. Um, and you love theology. Like yeah. you asked for, tell tell everyone what you uh -huh. asked for for your birthday when you're, most of us would read, you know, Twilight, <laughs> the Twilight series. Yeah. I cannot read. Oh my gosh. I cannot read narrative books. I really, I would never, ever, ever sit down and just read a good book. Um, I, I would read a like systematic theology or the Bible or like some sort of, I guess like people will call like a self-help book when that will help me grow. Um, and I think one thing I've talked about too with my mom is that I have this kind of productive mindset. So everything needs to be productive. And so I think one thing about reading a book like Twilight or something, I'm like, that's not productive to me in any way, shape or form. So like, why would I do that? And I, if I don't enjoy it and it's not productive, there's absolutely no point in my brain. And so logically it just seems in my brain seems stupid to do that. Well, and, you know, she hasn't always been like this. So I'm going to do a little quick uh, riff here on how she has changed because the lion type. So Jordan has an introverted thinking brain, but she's also the lion behavior pattern and lions morph more than any other type because they learn from life and they learn from doing so little lion cubs like Jordan, they just want to have fun and they're in the moment and they're not thinking about anything else, but you know what they're going to have for their next snack. Um, and so Jordan has completely morphed. So I'm just going to do a quick morph here or a quick riff on this. So Jordan, you used to eat nothing but junk food. And now what do you eat? Um, I would say I still enjoy junk food for sure. I love it. It's great. Oh. So I, I have a relatively healthy diet. So for me, compared to what I used to eat, my diet's great. And you used to have a super messy room. We used to fight about that. And you would clean your room by throwing everything under your bed, including like bananas and yogurt. And so what's your room like now? I, I'll, I'll show you. This is my, I actually didn't clean it intentionally. This is just what it looks like. It's just, it's, it's pretty, yes. I don't know. It's my shoes are over there. My bed's not made, but okay. most, it's pretty clean. Yeah. And, and she used to be really hard to get going in the morning and she wouldn't go to bed. It was hard to get her to go to bed. Now, Jordan, talk about your sleep schedule. For most of college, my sleep schedule was much more punctual because I was a student athlete. So my freshman and sophomore year, I was very disciplined. I would always go to bed around nine or 10. And then I'd end up waking up between like five and six. Like I need to get eight hours of sleep and I need to have some time in the morning where I can spend time in the Bible and pray. You weren't into, you weren't into shopping and anything girly and all of a sudden that morphed, right? Yeah, that was just from, I think being in college, being around other girls, um, realizing that there's actually fun things about being a girl and I actually love being a girl. It's just, um, I think I needed to have really close girlfriends to um, show me that, yeah. And you used to, you used to only have one close friend and, um, and now you have a ton of friends. You used to have a really weird sense of humor that nobody understood. Now you have a super weird sense of humor, but it is hilarious. So that's really <laughs> morphed. Um, okay. you used to have bad grades and now name off a couple of your classes, just name off a couple of the classes you've had. Oh gosh. Um, right now I'm in a class called dynamics. It's like the physics of moving objects. It's like, it's rough. Um, what's that one that was quantum? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Quantum mechanics and relativity. So quantum physics, but um, that's like my third upper division physics class, I think. And then, um, circuits one, I'm going to have to take mechatronics next year, which is going to be rough. <laughs> and then you didn't, you didn't used to have any other interests other than watching movies. And I thought you were lazy. I was worried about you because all you wanted to do was watch movies. You were the sensory seeker. And now you have so many interests. It's absolutely staggering um you weren't snuggly at all when you were a kid at all and now you're totally snuggly and yeah you you weren't a dedicated athlete and now 
you are. You even went out for sports and you're a double black skier and used to hate skiing. So mm -hmm. can you speak to this, this morph? Because what happens is introverted thinking is they like to discipline themselves. Introverted thinking is very intrinsically motivated and it doesn't like to be told what to do. And so it makes it hard to parent a child that doesn't want to be told what to do. So what made you morph from not wanting to do these things to now you're doing them all, like playing piano and skiing and sports? I think it was honestly just like what you said. If anyone told me to do anything, I didn't want to do it. So it was just a matter of me maturing and growing older and when I was younger, the things that I wanted to do. And even when I was maybe middle school, late elementary school, when I started to like skiing and started to like some of these things, um, I would say maybe even early high school. I can't remember exactly when, um, but it was because I chose to do them. It's because Jordan made the executive decision. I am going to get good at piano and I'm going to use that skill for uh, it's going to be a useful skill and I'm going to ski like I'm going to be a runner you know I'm going to be an athlete I'm going to be strong and tough so when I chose to make those decisions then it was a whole different ball game because I was the one in control but if anyone was ever trying to like control me I just didn't care and I didn't want to do any of the things um so, so I that's what made me back off as your mom, I, and then for any parent listening or watching, um, you got to let your thinker lion have tons of freedom and allow them to, you know, you have, you know, you have some rules, obviously we have rules, um, but you make those rules few and far between and you let your thinker lion kind of decide and come around on their own. Like you, we would tell you what we wanted for you. And then we give you a chance to kind of think about it and process it for yourself. And then usually within two or three days, you'd come around and, and want to cooperate, but it kind of had to seem like it was your decision. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very true. So I didn't understand you as a child at all. Um, you were very independent, calm, courageous, and competitive, and that made you a poor loser too, playing games. And I'm sure a lot of parents have that issue with their lion kids. But, um, and you, it was even more so with you because you're a thinker lion and feeling is in the back seat. So you didn't really care about how other people were being affected by, by that. So um, how would you say your competitive, competitive nature shows up today? And how do you control that? Very, very, very competitive person. And I think some ways it still has negative effects on me. For example, I have gotten really into spike ball over the, over the past few years. And the negative part of that is that I try not to play with other people that aren't as good as me because it's like not as fun or it's not competitive, if that makes sense, which is really bad. I recognize that because I want to be able to include everyone. And so there's times where I kind of have to force myself to be like, just like, just play the game. It's about other people having a good time. Stop making it about like, whether you, you know, whether it's a really competitive heated game. Cause I like to feel the heat and the action. I think because I know that I'm a sore loser, I've been able to grow from that and become more self-aware in that area. As a kid for the parents listening, I know it's painful when you have a sore loser in the family. So for you, it always helped to make things silly and to kind of make the game maybe a shorter game or to say, okay, Jordan, the choices are I can let you win or you can win fair and square because if, if, I, if you lose, you get really upset. So would you rather me let you win or win fair and square? And then also making the games like shorter maybe and not so much invested. And then sometimes we'd even like give a prize if you were the biggest loser to make it kind of silly. But because, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't. And so I think that was helpful. But um, yeah. also, you know, it was hard for me because I wanted to relate to you like a mother daughter, you know, feely kind of stuff. And 
one of the things we used to do is we'd go on one on one trips and we went to Texas one time and I took you zip lining and I thought it was going to be this really great thing for us to connect because you are this sensory seeker and it would be a great bonding thing. But what happened is you would walk 10 feet ahead of the whole group, including me. And do you remember that experience? Because I took it, yeah. this, this was about the time where I'm like, I have to learn my daughter because I was so upset with you. <laughs> you weren't talking, you were walking 10 feet ahead. And so in my opinion, in my feelings, it was like, we're not connected. She doesn't care. She, she doesn't care about mom, daughter bonding. <laughs> And what were you thinking about? I definitely wanted to seem tough and seem brave. But I also think that I just didn't, I don't, I've never, ever liked small talk ever. And so I I think I didn't, I didn't want to talk to you and I didn't want to talk to any of the other people there just because I didn't want to talk about like, what's your favorite subject? Like, what do you like about this? You know, I didn't want to talk about that. I would just be like, no, like, goodbye wanted to bring up that story for moms who are trying to relate to their daughter with this type it's not that you were trying to be that way that's just how you were wired and I just had to learn to kind of have different expectations for you because you're this very mm -hmm. strong courageous independent uh personality type so I expected you to know how to show and express your feelings um and I remember working with a parent who had her daughter uh, write a hundred times, I will show gratitude. Be And I noticed that with you, you didn't know how to show gratitude. Like I picked you up to go see Frozen one time in the middle of the day. And I was all excited and I thought you'd be so excited. And you weren't. Like you barely even responded. And <laughs> it's because you didn't really know so how sad. to show gratitude. And so even now... Well how does that affect you having extroverted feeling as your lowest function? Like, how does that show up for you? How has it showed up for you throughout your life? And how have you learned to kind of work on that? Like, or to, cause I know you were uncomfortable in social situations. Yeah. Yeah. And so you also asked me about the extroverted feeling, right? That being, um, yeah. So I think that's kind of be become more evident to me that extroverted feeling is so low for me. And mom, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, how I've kind of perceived my extroverted feeling, it's not necessarily that I think a lot of ISTPs probably do struggle to talk about their emotions, but being a girl and being constantly surrounded by girls, that's become very easy for me. Like talking about it has become super easy. I'm able to be like, this is how I feel like, this is how I feel. Like, that's just how it is. That's not hard for me. But the hard part is knowing how to handle my emotions, knowing where do I put them? Like, what do I do if I'm feeling this way? Like, can I force myself to feel a different way or to act on that emotion? Or if I'm feeling this way, can I force myself to feel better? Can I force myself to feel something like, it's always just an act of like, I'm trying to like, kind of force my emotions into a box be like all right you go here you go here you go here um and that's I think that's how I perceive the extroverted feeling it's not necessarily I don't know how to talk about my emotions because I do it's more I don't know what to do with my emotions and and sometimes they'll come out like a three-year-old because they're your three-year-old brain function and so can you talk about that a little bit how you feel like sometimes your emotions are like a three-year-old yeah I feel like the main thing that I can think about um I think well there's two things I'm thinking about I think in dating relationships it's hard it's hard to differentiate what's real and what's not and so I think I've had to be really patient with my emotions I think that's wise for me I think the wise thing for me is to if I'm feeling a certain way give it some time um and because I think that sometimes I'll be feeling something, but it's just like out of me being bored or out of me being excited about something when in reality, it's like, it might not actually be a valid emotion. And I might just be like, kind of trying to put my emotions in a box, like I said, um, which, yeah. And then the other thing that I would say is I experience, I think my driving emotion is probably anger. 
And so I think I notice a lot of the times myself getting angry with other people. It's, I don't yell ever. I don't ever outwardly get mad. Like I'm not going to go fight someone or yell at someone, but I think I just sense this kind of internal, just like, ah, like I'm so, what do I do right now? Um, And so it's more just kind of like this, I feel lost in my brain, just like angry. I don't know if that makes sense at all. It's kind of hard to describe. Um, but I think sometimes, yeah, when I feel anger, it's it's kind of just like I'm stuck in this situation and I'm like, uh, like I need to force myself out of it. Um, Have you so- noticed how many times you've used the word force? Yeah. So this is a type eight, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Yeah. They they want to force things. And so as a child that they're trying to do that and they don't have the emotional maturity that Jordan does now. And um, I think what's really helpful for a child, if you have a type eight child, is to make sure it's kind of like having a, a new puppy. <laughs> you have to make sure that they get lots of exercise and like a trampoline was huge for you when you were a kid to have that trampoline to jump on and get your big energy out. Also, sometimes you'd have like just outbursts, like in the middle of class or in the middle of the car, you'd be like, I'm weird. Or you just have these big yeah. outbursts. And it's because type eights get bored and they need to feel like um, they are alive and having fun and energized and now you've learned how to um you've learned how to make fun in a situation where you're bored. Like when we were in Bangkok at a cocktail bar, Jordan was bored out of her gourd and she started putting ice cubes in my lap because that was entertaining her because I didn't realize you were doing it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you were just watching. And so that's that random out of the box introverted thinking too, that sense of humor, but also the type eight, like needing to be feel alive and needing to get that anger out with exercise and um and expressing it talking about it like if you have a type 8 child let them express their anger you know in a respectful way but let them talk about their anger um mm-hmm. because a lot of times we think that anger is bad and that yeah. we shouldn't let you talk about it so um yeah, so you talked a little bit about you don't like small talk. You've never been one to really like. So if you have a type eight daughter or son, don't take him out for a coffee date, right? Take him out for a breakfast date. You did not like that. You yeah. you liked fast and you didn't like going to restaurants either. So we had to take you to like Mongolian barbecue, something that was super fast or you could watch him cook in front of you because you just didn't like, you didn't like that. So, um, and that's when I had to just, I had to adjust my expectations for who my little girl was and not expect you to do what I wanted you to do. But I had to, you know, I had to meet you halfway and you've met me halfway. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I've learned from my daughter, I've learned from you, Jordan, so much, um, because we're opposites. So Jordan is a truth seeker. Um, a justice seeker, being a type eight and being an introverted thinker, they're very much about justice and fairness. And, and so I'm very much uh, not like that. I, I'm kind of happy in the gray area. I don't really need to know the right answer to everything. And so it's Jordan's helped me because she's challenged me to, to know what I believe. And you've really helped me in that way. So um, how has having me as a mom, since we're so opposite, has that helped you? Would you say, be careful. Well, how you this? <laughs> I think that I wouldn't know how to respond to other women's emotions specifically. Um, cause I think mom, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sometimes, um, when you're feeling emotions, it's really important for you to feel either validated or corrected in a very gentle and kind way. Um, I think those are two things that I've realized are really important in my girl friendships is validating my friends' feelings. Um, Even if I don't necessarily understand them, sometimes in my brain, I'll logically run through like, okay, yeah, like how they're feeling, it makes sense. Um, And so then I kind of have to force myself to be like, even though I'm not feeling that, and even though maybe it doesn't like, I can't fully empathize with them. Like, 
it's important for me to go out of my way to be like, that makes sense. Like you can feel this way. It's okay for you to feel these emotions. Um, I'm validating you in that. And then there's also times um, where I've had to learn how to, how to recognize um, cause I think as a more logical brain, it's a little bit easier for me to see when emotions like logically are not in the right place. Um, and I think also having a more sensitive in, um, uh, a more sensitive mother has helped me to learn how to like talk about emotions in a very gentle and kind way that's respectful to the person. So I've learned how to have a lot of respect for you. And I've learned how to have a lot of respect for my more emotional friends, because the thing is, is I've learned more, I've learned so much from you and as well as my other friends that like ENFJs, ESFJs, um, the more outwardly emotional types I've, I've really, really grown in friendships and relationships with, because it kind of tugs on all my weaknesses and been like, okay, like you need to work on these now. So um, mainly, I think just being able to listen to other people's emotions and, um, and empathize with them um, and comfort them. I would say that's like the main thing that I have learned. Well, and um, you have a, you know, people watching this or listening to this probably would never guess that you are an introvert. And uh, probably most people that know you would not guess that either. Because yes. you are an extroverted introvert. You're one of those examples of an extroverted introvert because your secondary function, which is what makes you a lion, is extroverted sensing, which loves to have fun and be goofy and play. And um, But your number one function is that introverted thinking. So can you talk about what that's like being an extroverted introvert? Yeah, I think especially in college, it's really interesting because... I think in college, I probably look like an extrovert, but I think one marker of be, me actually being an introvert is if um, you see me like at a big social gathering where I, maybe I have to exercise small talk a lot, I will not be social for like a day or two after having to exercise a lot of small talk. Small talk is so draining for me. I cannot even explain to you. But like college is a very social setting. So I run into a lot of people that I know and some of my friendships aren't as deep. So whenever I see these people, this sounds so terrible, but sometimes I almost kind of want to avoid them because I'm like, I don't want to do small talk with them. Like the only thing I feel like that is energizing for me socially is like either just like sitting, listening to people talk and like kind of chiming in here and there, just like either really deep conversation or really like pointless, aimless conversation, like mindless. I, it's either like super deep and super engaged and like, wow, this is really impactful. And this is really amazing. Or it's, um, or it's like, I don't know what we're talking about. I could check out at any point and it doesn't even matter. So I think more of my, I guess, conversation um, is where I feel like I can tell that I'm an introvert, but I think I love the group. I love being a part of a group and I love being a leader. I love being strong. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Well, and I, I, I would notice when I'd pick you up from school that me going, how was your day? What did you learn? All that was not serving you at all. It wasn't serving either one of us. So I finally, once I learned about you, I, and it would bother me because I felt like you were giving your best at school. You were all charming and all your teachers loved you. And then you'd come home and you'd just be like, eh. <laughs> and it's because you were giving all day long and it was draining your battery. And that's how having an introverted driver brain function and, and then an extroverted co-pilot, that's how it works is like you were using your extroverted sensing co-pilot and that was draining your battery and so then you would just want to settle into just being introverted thinking. And so I just said, Jordan, you know, it's okay if you don't want to talk, you know, you can talk if you want to, but we don't have to talk. And then yeah. when you were ready to talk or you just wanted to be goofy and decompress, you know, yeah. then, you know, cause that's what you love. And, and so Jordan, I think too, when you're leading and when you're teaching, I think that energizes you. And I think listening drains you, would you say? 
Yeah. Yeah, it kind of depends on who I'm listening to. Because, like, if I'm listening to a missionary, an engineer missionary, that's not going to be draining for me. Because that's, like, my passion. That's what I want to do. Um, but I think if I'm just listening to someone talk about their day and, like, what they've done, unless it's, like, a very close friend, um, like, very, very close friend. I think, like, some of the closest people in my life that can be life-giving, even sometimes not. Like, sometimes I just don't want to talk at all. Um, and I know, Mom, you know that. Like, sometimes I'm not the best listener to you at all. Um, and sometimes I'm just kind of checked out. Um, but there are some times where I think it is. But for the most part, I would say listening is can be pretty draining for me. Well, another huge morph you had, and this is probably going to be hard for people to um, believe when they hear all the classes that you had, but, you know, what were your grades like in elementary school and talk about what kind of a kid you were in elementary school. In elementary school, I was like a C, D student, you know, the best grade I had, I think was a B. And where Um, did you sit? Huh? Where did you sit? Yeah, I was sat at the front. I was the, I was the trouble. On a bouncy, on a bouncy chair. Yeah, on a little bouncy chair, so. And you had ADHD. Mm -hmm. I had to take medicine and I hated the medicine. I hated, uh, yeah. Can I talk to that real quick? So she at first was begging us to put her on the medicine. Do you remember that? You wanted the medicine because you thought that was going to make you instantly like the easy way to a better student. And so we went ahead at first, we put you on a placebo, like a fake pill. Do you remember that? And you figured it out. You figured it out after a while that it was a fake pill. And so you're like, put me on the real thing. And so we did a really, really low dose and you hated it. Can you explain why you hated it? It kind of, it made me feel like I wasn't myself. I was really calm and I was just like, I feel like I couldn't be excited about things even if I wanted to. So it it was just, it made me, yeah, I just didn't like it. It made me feel like a different person. I like, and I think part of it is because I like feeling excited and I like having fun. And I feel like the pill kind of took that away a little bit. And so that was an awesome way that you learned from experience because that's how lions like to learn. You learn from experience that having that quick fix pill was not the answer. And so, but you eventually grew out of your ADHD and, um, you just had a huge morph. What really changed you, because as a thinking lion, you like to learn from seeing something and having a role model and having freedom. And so we sent you on a mission trip to El Salvador because you were starting to kind of hang out with the wrong crowd and you were kind of starting to imitate them and you were kind of starting to be dishonest and lie to us. Do you remember that? And Mm -hmm. we sent you on this mission trip to El Salvador. And can you talk about how that changed your life? Yeah, I'm not really even exactly sure why that was so impactful to me. Um, I think it was just, that was really what God wanted me to do. And I think that he really transformed my heart on that trip. I saw people who um, were in a, just in such a deep need. And um, that was definitely ever since that trip, that was, I wanted to do something about it and I wanted to help. I wanted to be on the mission field. I think that's one thing is I loved being on the mission field. I loved being face to face with the people. Um, And that's the kind of listening that's not draining to me is like hearing new people's stories and hearing where they're from, learning new cultures and things like that. So it was my first time kind of experiencing a new culture in that way, where I was like kind of in the slums with these people. Um, And I think just you having freedom and you having these role models, like, you know, the role model you were with that single gal, I won't Mm -hmm. say her name, but I think she was like a role model for you because she was a singer, she loved God. And you came back from that trip, you kind of talked like her, you were leading worship like her, you were having a Bible study like her. And I don't know if it was a conscious thing, but I just think having role models and having freedom to decide who you wanted to be. Yeah. 
I would say one thing I will say about like maybe an ISTP, I think it's pretty rare if an ISTP really admires and looks up to someone. Um, I feel like that's pretty rare because even in my life, like I, there's a, maybe um, like there's a few people in my life that I truly admire in like in that way like a mentor kind of way like I want to follow in their footsteps like that's a pretty rare thing for an ISTP I think because we're so independent um and so I'm not really I'm not exactly sure if that's what happened on that trip but um my mentor through middle school and no through high school was definitely a big part of my spiritual growth like being able to look up to someone um was kind of a big deal because I think before her, I didn't really look up to anyone, um, if that makes sense. Including including your mom. <laughs> <laughs> would you say even, would you say that most of the people you admire as mentors are men? This might, this might sound bad. This is just me being kind of raw and candid. I think I, I tend to have more respect and more more easily admire men because they're more wired like me mm -hmm. because they're able to logically approach their situations and their emotions. Um, whereas I think sometimes I get bothered when I don't see other women doing that. Um, and so I think it's more easily easy for me to do that. So even my mentor, um, like, or like my mentor throughout high school, I, I think she, she's definitely more of a logical person. And I think I, I think that's part of the reason I admired her is because I think I was actually similar to her in a lot of ways, like very leadership oriented and logical. I think that's where I quickly go to um, admire, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And so I'm just uh, want to encourage parents of your little ISTP um, that it's not you. <laughs> it's the way your child is wired. And, um, I had to learn my daughter. I had to learn that lectures didn't work with you because if I were lecturing you or saying, how many times do I have to tell you that you're thinking, are you saying I'm dumb? I mean, it's, it's, your thinking, I'm, do you think I'm dumb? And, you know, so with your type, it works better to have rewards and then to really be um, clear with what the the red rules are, like rules that are like not hitting or not destroying property or not being disrespectful or lying, you know, those kinds of rules um, need to be clear. And there needs to be really clear consequence. Like for you, I think we grounded you from friends or we grounded you from your freedom because as a lion freedom is number one for you so that was your consequence um but then we also had a lot of rewards for you which mm -hmm. was motivating for you mm -hmm. like sensory seeking kinds of rewards like we had a treasure box mm -hmm. with, with candy that we let you pick but one of the biggest things with you is that you are here you are an engineer with this amazing brain that's why you were so argumentative as a child, because your one of your number one strengths is negotiation and problem solving. And so you were just, that was your way of saying, can you let me have a say in how I'm disciplined? Can you let me have a say in how this works? And so I started letting you um, negotiate and problem, help us problem solve. And it made my job as a parent a lot easier. Like I tell you, no, you can't go to that party or you can't go to your friend's house. And you'd say, but well, mom, how about this? How about, how about if I clean my room and we spend some time together? Do you remember doing yeah. that? We, we spend some time together and then I can go like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was good at compromising. Yes, and you were. Yeah. 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 And so let your child have more power. And it might seem like you're being a weak parent, but it's what you need. You need to feel like you have power. You're this powerful type eight. And a lot of ISTPs, introverted thinkers, are type eights. Some of them are type fives. I would say an INTP might be more on a type five, the observer. But 
you as an ISTP, I've met a lot that are type eights. So, yeah. so do you have any final thoughts about just what you've learned about yourself over the years? And yeah, I, I have two more thoughts that I feel like I didn't talk about enough about my type is fairness. Um, I think that that is also something that I was, um, thinking about talking about because I, that is something I see in my life daily. And so if there's an, ever a situation where, um, you're dealing with an ISDP and something's not fair, um, it's just, you cannot, it's, they're not going to budge. Um, the problem I, is, is it's your version of fairness and that's actually a type eight fixation is injustice. Did you know that? Yeah. But growth for a type eight is to pay attention to how many times you're thinking about injustice mm. and try to refocus your brain onto another, something else, like either yeah. your breath or your body, like go on a run or like something yeah. or, or God or a verse or, you know, something about maybe mercy or, you know, to yeah. get your mind off of the injustice. But, um, but yeah, could you talk about what we tried to do with you as a kid? Every time you'd say the dishes were unfair, do you remember? Um, I don't remember what we did. No, we would give you days of week. Oh, right, right. Yeah. But, but the problem is there are seven days in a week, which is not an even number. Yeah. So what would happen on the uneven day? Do you remember? Um, I think that we would both just do it. And now it's, and so I think now what I would say with fairness is one thing that I would have, what I've had to really intentionally focus on is there's a passage in the Bible and it's when Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, um, never avenge yourselves, but you're always supposed to seek after the justice of other people. So I I have to be very intentional about thinking about other people's justice, seeking after justice for other people. And when it comes to my own justice, like just literally forcing myself to let it go. Because as much as I, like I said, as much as I want to force myself or force the situation, I want to like force the situation in a place, make it fair for myself. Instead, I'm, cho I'm choosing to force myself to be like, nope, just move on. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think as a parent, all you can really do is model patience because that's one thing you struggle with. So model patience with your type eight, that nothing's ever fair and just try to make things as fair as possible. And then maybe, you know, we tried to let you determine what was fair and what wasn't fair, but that it didn't always work but yeah. the more that we would let you kind of have a voice in that. I think that that helped. If you're a mom parenting an ISTP boy or an ISTP girl, just don't make them try. <laughs> just yeah. Maybe just let them be a little bit more and don't have as many expectations for them relationally, would you say? Uh, yeah, I think it depends on what you define as like relation like well, you have, love to have fun I mean well I also love to have fun I also like I kind of like to just sit and think too mm -hmm. and I like doing that in the presence of someone like mm -hmm. I do like to cuddle with my friends and like I like back rubs and things like that but those aren't even verbal none of that's verbal communication and so I kind of view um, relating to people and having a relationship with people, I think maybe a little bit different than a lot of people would. Um, I think when people think about connecting with someone, they're like, let's get coffee. But for me, that's not, not always my first, um, how do I connect with a friend type of thing? So, yeah. Yeah. So you though, as a kid, didn't really even like physical touch that much because you didn't want to hold still, you know? So, yeah. I think for you as a kid, I think connecting time with you was usually doing something mm -hmm. fun and goofy. And yeah. so you always yeah. loved, loved that. Yeah. And I still love that kind of stuff. Like the other mm -hmm. week I went, um, my favorite part of this whole camping trip, I went on with a big group of friends. Um, yeah, I liked hiking with them and talking with them. And I liked being around the campground with them and talking with them. Like that's all fun. 
um, kind of just like being casual and stuff. But the most fun part for me was exploring, going off the trail, going up this waterfall, like kind of hiking around, doing something adventurous and new. Um, and so I think that that's definitely still a part of me is I would rather, I'd way rather go on a hike or like go surfing or do something with my friends than like sit down and get coffee with them, if that makes sense. Well, and also I think, I think you have to have an exciting activity because you didn't want to go on walks and you still don't really like going on walks. Like you'd rather do something that's exciting. I like like a really big hike, but not really a walk. I'll walk by myself. I love walking by myself. And I think that's because I like to think so much. Um, I love walking by myself, but I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of walking one-on-one -on -one with other people or like doing sit down time. I like to do like a really big intense hike or like some new adventure or like surfing, like I said, or playing spike ball or pickleball or something fun like that. I don't know if that makes sense. So, oh, it totally does. But it's so, and then you wouldn't want to do Zumba either. Remember? Like, cause yeah, I think it's just like, I, I think like, that's like a class. You didn't like things that yeah. were organized. Mm -hmm. oh, and that's another thing to talk about is like your free spiritness. Like you didn't like when we had a plan, because if you didn't feel like the plan in the moment, mm -hmm. You, but then I'd be super busy and you'd be like, mom, let's go do this. And I'm like, sorry. Yeah. I, it, I it, already have plans. Like if I feel like it. So like, I would always feel hesitant about like, if you'd be like, oh, Jordan, like, do you want to go do this in a week? I'd be like, um, yeah, I'm free, but I can't guarantee that my little introvert self will actually want to do that at the time. So like, I would say probably like 30 to 40% of the time I'm like ready to engage in like that type of activity. You know what I mean? Like going, sitting down, having a meal with someone or like going shopping or something. I'm usually like 40% of the time ready to do that. But the other 60% of the time I'm like ready to sit around and do something else spontaneous. Like let's go to the store and make some random like dessert or something for no reason. Like if it's not a plan and it, I don't know why, but for some reason, like also like sometimes planning, like going somewhere out of my ways can feel exhausting or sound exhausting. Sometimes just doing something random and fun is um, like, I think for moms and dads who are wanting to relate to your kid, like, you know, maybe like something that I would have loved as a kid is like, going to the store with them and like letting them pick out random ingredients to like make some sort of weird meal or something. Like I, I would have loved that as a kid being like, Oh, like, let's like pick these things off the shelf and like, let's try and like, just make something random. I don't we know if that's like, do that once we had we that. We took that. random stuff out of our refrigerator. And yeah. I loved, I remember, I clearly remember that we, we did like a, a what, what is the show called? Like chop, chopped or thing yeah yeah where but you had the mystery basket yeah you had the mystery bat I loved that I remember as a kid so like that's an example of something that's like really weird and random um that I just really liked or like tonight me and my housemate we're gonna go to the store and we're gonna just like get some stuff and like bake this like thing in a pan like it's like this cookie ice cream thing but we just decided to do that like an hour ago um in like, a pan it's like a cookie thing that she wanted to make but I got excited about it because I was like oh like this is super fun and spontaneous like just super random um so I don't know if that and so poor Jordan poor Jordan you were stuck in a household full of J's we're all type J which is like conventional planned yeah um, and you were just totally uh I love and yeah. random and we're all feelers and you're the only thinker and but everybody's an introvert except for me so <laughs> you were you were in good company there so, yeah. so anyway uh, oh I love you hun and thank you oh for love you mom again. thanks all for right. asking so many questions I hope this was all helpful remember when we did the eating like dogs and you got to eat your food like a dog with your face in the plate you loved that yeah what, is, 
Well, there's some other activities or things that so, yeah. so anyway. Uh, oh, I love you, hon. And thank you. Oh, for love you, mom. Together. Thanks all for right. asking so many questions. I hope this was all helpful. That parents can do to connect with their ISTP. I think that is definitely a really good example. So if you're a parent, if you're a parent out there trying to parent your ISTP or eight kid, um, if there's like, if they hate broccoli or if they hate whatever and you're trying to give them, be like, all right, we're all going to like sit on the floor and we're going to like move the table. We're going to like not let the dog in the kitchen. We're all going to sit on the floor and like eat like we're little animals. Um, that would be so fun to me. Like, you know, putting couch cushions on the floor and like all eating like your animals and like being goofy. I think as a kid, I would have eaten that whole meal. <laughs> that meal would be gone. Um, I'm trying to think there's so many other fun things, building forts, build forts with your, and, and go in and like help, help your kids with the fort. But I think as an ISTP kid, you let the kid be the leader of building the fort. So be like, okay, how do you want to build this fort? Like, tell me your vision. And then. Oh, like, that's so, that's so good. I forgot about that. Whenever we would cook with you, we'd have to let you be the leader. Yeah. And you had to tell us what to do. Yep. Yeah. So I think, I think building forts was always something that was really fun. Or one thing that I did that was super fun. This sounds so weird, but I had a bunch of stuffed animals and we had a balcony at our house. So we created like a little animal zip line with string. So even things like that, like being like, let's make a zip line for your stuffed animals. And then and then letting the ISTP or eight figure it out because those are type of, those are fun things that for me as like a little engineer brain, I'm like, how do I make this zip line for my stuffed animals? And, um, and yeah, just fun things like that. Any opportunity to do like gymnastics or any type of like flipping around or like, I think, um, mom, you, you like braided together this rope with like really strong fabric. And I remember I like played with that rope and I tried to figure out like ways that I could hang from it. Building a tree house. That was so fun. I loved building a tree house. So like, I think a lot of things with like forts and systems and like, um, um, like taking the lead of like some weird project arts and crafts. No, just, huh. no, I, I was not a big arts and crafts girl. Um, so I don't know. Those are like, we some, should have given you yeah. a hammer and nails at a really young exactly. age. No, seriously, <laughs> let, me, let me build something in our tree house. I mean, like, yeah. um, but obviously that's yeah. wisdom of that don't give your kid a hammer and nails all the time. Yeah. But we did let you lead. We let you be the boss. You liked, you liked that. So yeah. we would we take turns being the boss, but we would let you be the boss a lot. So yeah. But I mean, I think it's also good to not let the kid be the boss because I think I I needed to be humble humbled a lot of the time consequences were good for me to like be humbled um and I think now growing up um I think that as an ISTP I like understand the balance between like leading and not leading I know what it is that doesn't mean I'm good at carrying that out all the time um but yeah so and that's why we put you in school when you were four because her birthday yeah. is in August, August 27th. Mm -hmm. And I thought this girl is going to be in charge of the classroom. So we're going to start her at four so that she's the youngest. Yeah. You know, you didn't like that a lot, like when your friends were driving and when you were the youngest all the time, but I think it helped with humbling you. Like, yeah. Oh, uh, well, I love you, hon. And thank you. Oh, for love you, mom. Together. Thanks all for right. asking so many questions. I hope this was all helpful.